final panel of the day uh, when we're uh, looking at some of those questions from a different point of view. Um, what do we need to ensure the future is fair, inclusive and sustainable for everyone? Uh, again, what does a good future look like? from many perspectives and quite contentious, and how will design help get us there? To discuss this, please can I invite to the stage Dr. Gus Casely Hayford, the director of VNA East, Peter Webster, senior, senior strategic designer from Arup, Dr. Guan Li, director for Grimsdyke Farm and co-director of the Material Architecture Lab at the Bartlett, and Annie Warburton, CEO of the Goldsmiths company. I'll just introduce Gus and he'll introduce the rest. Um, so Gus is chairing, he'll introduce his panel. Uh, Dr. Gus Casey Hayford is the first director of VNA East, a museum and collection centre presently under construction but going very well, I understand. He was previously the director of the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. He's a curator and cultural historian who writes lectures and broadcasts widely on culture. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And thank you, everyone. Um, and thank you for everyone at Des London Design Biennial for bringing us together. Thank you, Samuel, for your brilliant kind of um, conceptual oversight. And thank you to our speakers. Um, should we just push on rather than kind of have long introductions? You could Google these are kind of superstars. So I just want to kind of um, hear from them. And it's, I mean, what a great set of sessions helping us to kind of really begin to navigate some of the sort of big questions of today. You know, how do we create a future that feels fair, that feels inclusive, but critically that is sustainable for everyone? And what is the world that we want to leave to our children? And, you know, this fantastic panel, it would be great if we could just begin to kind of think about some of those sorts of issues and particularly in light of some of the really interesting kind of questions raised by the kind of the previous panels. Um, what role do we think that design plays in ensuring that we can in really achieve a fair, inclusive and sustainable future? Um, could we start with you, Annie? Okay. Please. Thank you very much, Gus. Um, my background is very much in craft and the craft side of design. And often I'm, I'm asked what the difference is between craft and design. And I say, well, actually, there is no difference in a certain sense. But actually, if you're going to think about what is the difference, then craft starts with the material. It start, it's about the unspoken intelligence in the hands, about material intelligence, creative, practical intelligence. Um, so you might start with a question, but you're, you're working up from the material, whereas design might start with the idea, the plan, the drawing, or the blueprint. Now, of course, those are just two sides of the same coin, and often they are incorporated in the same person. So if I'm, so I'm coming from a craft perspective, and in terms of supporting us to create a better world, a fairer world, Craft connects us to ourselves, it connects us to our embodied being in this physical world. It's about stuff, right? Um, craft connects us to each other. You can't make something without thinking about the person for whom you are making it. It's relational, okay? And fundamentally, craft connects us to the world around us. Because it's about material, it makes us curious about what something is made from, where that material comes from, how it's probably extracted, but more frequently now, thankfully, not extracted, but repurposed. It makes us think differently about waste. It makes us eradicate the category of waste. It's just another material. So craft does, a, does those three things. But how do we secure the sort of the vulnerable makers, the sorts of people who, <laughs> who really are innovating and the sorts yeah. of people who also represent traditional practice, mm -hmm. you know, for whom very often dealing with isolation, dealing with kind of, you know, challenges of technologies, dealing with kind of, you know, globalization, you know, for them, mm -hmm. how do we tr look after their particular vulnerabilities? So I can think of two models. One, one in which I, I've, I've just uh, come from running a place called Cockpit, which is a creative community in London of 170 independent creative businesses. Um, London is 
one of the most creative cities in the world, I would argue. Um, it's also definitely one of the most expensive cities in the world. And to start a small creative business, you are vulnerable, you are isolated. Unless you've got a private means, then you're not going to be able to start up your, your creative business here. And what Cockpit does is of those 170 businesses, 20%, so one in five places are free of charge. You get a free workspace for a year or up to three years. You get in-house business support, business coaching and mentoring to help you take your idea and think about what is the market for it, how do I apply it. Um, and you have a community, a community of fellow makers, some of whom have been there a decade or more and really are at the top of their game and you're, you're coming in and you're becoming part of that community. That's one model. A very different model but doing the same thing in a different way is something like Granby Workshop in Liverpool which is a collective, a social enterprise as well but that is about regenerating place, a hyper local social enterprise that's regenerating place through craft and through making. I could speak much more but I've already <laughs> spoken. <laughs> And, and in terms of the work that, um, that, that, that you're doing, I mean, how do we... It's about kind of fairness and achieving something that feels really, truly sustainable, inclusive, but also that looks to the future. The how do we future-proof some of these things? What? Um, yeah, just a little context. I, I, I set up Grimstake Farm, which is my... Um, workplace uh, playground uh, 20 years ago and um, the the aim was to um, establish um, a place where we uh, value intimate engagement with material through processes of making with people and with the place so for me it's very specific it's Lacey Green in Buckinghamshire you know between London and Oxford uh, but what I, what, there was a very particular point uh, uh, in my residency there that I um, encountered this. I want to show the first slide. I think I want to use it as a way to sort of explain to you what I mean and how I see this. Uh, Grimstein Farm sits on top of a geological condition called clay with flint. So I dug this hole in you know, in, at the farm. And underneath it is clay. And clay, when you mix it with w water, it's, you know, soft and malleable. And when you let it dry, it becomes a little bit, you know, it will shrink and crack. And what the image you see on the screen is the, the clay with all the flint taken out, very carefully mixed with water and smooth over this surface over and over again. But uh, with time, it would crack and would dry. And in order for this to exist, we would really have to literally caress this hole endlessly, <laughs> every day, time and again, to prevent it from getting dry. Mm. And, and I think, uh, what what it, what uh, what what became a, a thing that I I value now very much from this work that I, I did uh, more than ten years ago now is that it's maintenance and care. If we want to have uh, I don't know something that is it's it's good for us, we have to. Things will always change, material always change, you know, clay cracks and, you know, do all kinds of funny things. But in order for us to engage with it in a, in a meaningful way, we would have to want to maintain it. Something is always changing, but for it to stay the same, maybe we have to change. You know, we have to, we have to care for it, we have to maintain it. And it's, a, it, it's something that I, I think that, you know, it's, it's a very simple concept, perhaps. It is very directly related to the material and my place. And yeah, I think that's, that's sort of my, uh, my take. Uh, could you talk, because part of that is it's incumbent on having the right advocates. It's building a, it's building a message that is inclusive, but then creating the sorts of interfaces where others actually feel that they can find a part and a place that they can engage and they can actually 
really feel like they're making a difference to these sorts of projects? I mean, uh, is that something that you've, you've found at the farm that you've been able to do is to integrate others and for those others to actually feel that they can make a meaningful contribution? Yes, so for me personally, the way I did that was to engage with academia. So I teach in various universities. I run workshop for uh, university within you know the UK, but also abroad. And I engage with the local, uh, you know, my my neighbors and you know the local schools. Um, so I invite people to my home, and that's basically what I uh, what I've been doing. But one thing that is really important for this relationship to be built is that I'm there. I'm here to stay, and people can come visit me. And this is a place that is open mm. to people to come and play and. And no, so that's me sharing. Mm -hmm. And I share it through, you know, official channels, academia, but also whoever emails me, um, you know, I try <laughs> to accommodate. <laughs> so, so, so if I email you, I'm... I'm Please. I'm, yes, yeah? yes, yeah, that. Uh, the, the other thing I just want to add is that, you know, I, well, I, what I want to do is to try to, you know, in a way to say that, you know, it's not to be... So, to not to be too human centric with my approach. I'm just saying, look at the clay. The clay, you know, can speak to us. You know, I, you know, I, yeah, that's, you know, in a way I, I want to say that we can connect to materials, to processes of production and making and craft. I very much agree with what Anne was saying. And, and Peter, both of these examples, they rely on really good stewardship on great relationships, on the sorts of people who are really committed to making a difference. Can you talk a little bit about, in terms of inclusivity and fairness and all of the things that have really set out today, how at Arup that you are thinking about how you will define your future in relation to those things? Yeah, so um, there's a few projects that kind of spring to mind, but don't necessarily kind of want to talk about projects per se. I mean, I think just hearing what Guan and Annie have just spoken about is being really direct with the values that we want to embed within place, right? And really that's kind of what it's all about is making sure that right at the start of any given project or direction that we make the right choices around A, what ethics we want to embed in that place, but also really embedding those from the community who are of that place in the first instance. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a project that we're doing in County Durham in the northeast of England looking at sustainable urban drainage systems. And to most of you, you might think, God, this man's talking about drainage at Chatham House. <laughs> but really, it's thinking around how to embed value for how that community has been transitioning and is continuing to transition from being a post-industrial, post-mining community, a community very much rooted with material, whether that's steel or coal. Um, and so with that, that's not necessarily going up there and you know, say, making the gesture of doing it, but it's a multi-year program where making sure that we're really spending time with the community to draw out with them what they need their place to be in the future. And ultimately how their place can be resilient to future flooding events. That's what these drainage systems are all about. But so that these systems aren't just put in place, the community has the systems and the embedded knowledge within there to support that over time. And I think that's really kind of to think around how design is leading the way to really start thinking about how design is a industry or discipline or as uh, Dr. Samuel Ross starts off with, as an operating system is really starting to change, is that it's more of this kind of third wave, emancipatory, ethical turn within design is emerging that encapsulates much more of the sociality that might be embedded within human-centered design or the technicality that really comes from understanding a craft over the course of a 20, 25-year profession. But the previous two examples are very located. They are very much about particularity of so and I'm in, in within Arab, I mean I'm imagining that the learning that you have you have kind of gained from 
these particular drainage systems that you could then deploy else. And I'm just wondering how you, you then take the particularity of a situation and how you re then redeploy that learning elsewhere. How do you actually kind of take advantage of what feels like a shift in thinking yeah. to make sure that there are kind of universal or, or, or wide benefits? So I think we've got to also be really careful with this, particularly when we use what sort of might be termed as sort of a co-design process, yeah. that we don't kind of co-opt that as a mechanism for copying and pasting solutions within a place. Yeah. This is to make sure that the community is resilient to taking care of and supporting that system over time. And that community, based on its kind of geographic positioning in the UK, its social positioning in the UK, will have very different mechanisms for supporting that over time than, you know, say you were doing that in Bristol mm -hmm. or in the southeast of England as well. And so that's really why you need to, you know, you can take a process framed around engagement and maybe try and deploy that elsewhere, but the results aren't going to be the same. You know, we really need to be careful to really deeply understand and in a non-transactional sense, you know, equate and account for the knowledge systems that are held within those communities. So again, we're not simply extracting the IP from yes. those communities. You know, it's really generating future value for them. Yeah. But are there not ways in which we can learn from this time and learn from previous periods by taking by taking examples, by taking kind of trends, by beginning to kind of feel that there is kind of accreted value in the learnings of particular particular places, but also in terms of the wider sector. I mean, that's something for all of us to think about. I mean, particularly in the sort of areas in which you're working, is there learning for everyone? Are there principles? Are there the beginnings of of kind of wider th thoughts that could be that could be extracted and taken away? You're not prepared to. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, that's made me think about cockpit again, actually. And when I, I was there for five years, and when I was there, people would come and knock on our door weekly, actually, um, saying, oh, can you come up to Edinburgh or Sheffield or Bristol or Penzance or Norwich, and can, can, we, can we do cockpit there? And uh, we'd always say, look, we'll, we'll come and, you know, come and see what we do, come and, you know, hit, hit, we'll open our, 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 all of our documents, just see the model, you know, we'll share it. But no, we're not going to come out of London and go to your city or your place and do cockpit there because that's not going to work. So we can share the tools, um, but you, you do it, you know. Um, so that, that's how, how we approach that. And then how do, I mean, if, I mean, if this is the case, and how do we make sure that we embed, and we embed well, we embed with integrity, and we embed in ways that offer longevity? I'm really interested in, in how, if this is what we're, we're kind of really focusing on, how we make sure that it offers real longitudinal, longitudinal benefits. Well, um, I... I the, the the idea of um, longevity is really interesting because I, I you know this has been a very inspiring day for me from all the various speakers talking about materials and technology also you know especially this idea of you know bio um, materials and I uh, you know there is a shift you know especially in the last you know ten years towards let's say biomaterials so I've also started you know I was doing concrete that was you know not now not very fashionable so I. I do hempcrete, <laughs> um, but uh, the, the thing is that there is this fundamentally instability of biomaterials that I think that per perhaps to follow up from what I was saying earlier requires care. But also, I would like to take this opportunity to talk to you know the audience, but also to the Biennale about exhibition because. If we build something and then we change it next year or. You know, in material uh, experimentation, often we don't know how it's going to age in five years, how it's going to behave, you know, even next week possibly. But we need to build material, we need to build exhibition that will be there, that we can see 
over a number of years, perhaps maybe even as an example of you know, changing technologies. I, I, and so at the, at the farm, what I try to do is I do experiments, I leave them in the field and because I can, mm -hmm. and I let them rot because that's the only way I can learn. And it's not easy to find somewhere to build anything of a certain scale to let it rot. Yeah. Beca or, sorry, not necessarily rot, but sometimes <laughs> they, just, they just fall evolve. apart. <laughs> and if they evolve. And I built this hempcrete pavilion uh, four years ago now, and it's, it's a bit moldy, but it's still, it's, it's incredibly, it's still there. It's, uh, you know, uh, but I needed to see it. I needed to see it. And I, I think that in exhibition design, it would be great if we can make more exhibitions that are there, uh, and not just for a, you know, a short period of time. And you know, the longevity of the exhibition can also help with you know, uh, disseminating the knowledge, but also acquiring the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And in terms of yeah. craft-based projects, do you well, feel? Well, there's, um, Guan, you've sparked a couple of thoughts. One is, I, I've just joined an institution that is 697 years old. Wow. So it kind of gives you a, a different sense of time. And as, as you were talking, Guan, I was thinking, well, I was thinking about exhibitions I've done, and I put Matt Tsai on an exhibition but in the past, and thinking about, yeah, and, and so there's a, a legacy and a continuity and a relationality that happens through individuals taking ideas and, and propagating them elsewhere. So there's that kind of angle on longevity. Um, but also what you were saying, Guan, made me think about an idea of patient design. So we've got this concept of patient capital, um, and again, being in a nearly 700-year-old institution, I'm really guessing what patient capital <laughs> means. So let's have a long view. But actually, what you're talking about is patient design, which is a really exciting thought. Um, how can we yeah, change our mindset around that? Yes. I, wonder, I wonder whether it comes back to sort of skills, talent incubation, with how we sort of started the day, talking about DT skills within schools. How do we equip that next generation of designers coming through from high schools, coming through universities, with more of those test beds that you know, the previous panel spoke about exist at places like CSM, but expand them more widely so that the next generation of designers have that space to openly play with biomaterials, openly play with kind of biotechnology, and experiment and fail, but also I mean, this is an open question. I don't necessarily have the answer. How do we design that next wave of design education, really, mm -hmm. that isn't built from sort of this Bauhausian construct focused around sort of the techniques of design, but equips people with the skills to really experiment <laughs> with biomaterials and biofutures? And does your work interface with schools, with, you know, with kind of wider educational opportunity in any way, or is that something you would like to do? It, it does, yeah. I mean, actually, just being someone at the start of the day um, from um, the Saturday Mornings Club. And on the engineering side, Arab engages with schools, particularly in London, around skills transfer and skills enablement on Saturday mornings with kids and sort of how they can enter, I mean, the built environment profession more widely building into kind of more of that science, technology, engineering, maths perspective. That, My background's not in that, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. But th that must be the most palpable manifestation of a good future, is in seeing it as invested through education in young young people. Mm. I mean, is that something uh, that... 100%, that's why I brought this up. I was inspired by Duncan earlier to uh, bring a prop. So this, this is the um, Education Manifesto for Craft and Making, and it was launched 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, the number of students taking um, GCSE had f in design and technology had fallen by 50%, and Minnie's obviously has added a 68% on top of the 58%. So think about how much it's diminished. If you can't see the back, it says our future is in the making, and on the back it says it's in our hands. Um, and this manifesto was making the case for craft and design education, not only for the designers of the future, but also for the engineers of the future, mm -hmm. the technologists, the medics, 
It's about an education in and through our hands, perhaps for design, perhaps for craft, but also it's a fundamental human skill that enables us to repair, to reuse, um, but also to problem solve. And it builds, really old fashioned word here, character. So if you think about the etymology of character, it's what you've chiseled into stone, okay? And through making, we, we hone our own characters. So again, Cockpit um, is involved in the National Saturday Club. We're the first one we are no longer there, They're, they are the first one um, to be based in a working maker studios. It's in Deptford and not only are young people discovering how to make, they're also witnessing people who are like them running successful businesses. So they're getting that impression that it's not only a nice hobby, which if you go out into the street and say the word craft, most people think about something homey amateur and, and, uh, and a hobby. It's a really viable, important profession. But I visit at least one school a week, usually a couple, um, and the thing I find most heartbreaking is that generally schools are well facilitated by way of, of art spaces, of craft spaces. But in terms of the the teaching resource, it's been the area that's been most kind of pared back, yeah. most cut back. I mean, generally, it, it's the arts that if yeah. there is going to be any kind of um, uh, economies, that yeah. that's one of the areas in which there have been kind of cutbacks. And I just wonder, we have not managed to articulate successfully the very things that you're saying to the right sorts yeah. of people. And I, it's how we take some of the great examples that we've seen across the whole of today and particularly and, and on this platform as well and actually present them in ways that speak to those sorts of people who are making the right sort of decisions and I'm just wondering how we do that. I, well, well, do you... Can I have my uh, second slide? I, I, I want to, you know it's a kind of a question that I have to ask myself often so at the I don't want to be the clay touchy feely guy, but <laughs> so at the farm, that's good, that's good. <laughs> so I at the farm also have an industrial robotic arm that I work mm. with clay, and you know so so I, 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 so this idea of teaching uh, teaching others it's just the idea that I have to keep teaching myself. Mm. So one of the things that um, I did you know. Or, um, at the farm is also trying to find ways that I can learn because if I don't learn then you know there is nothing else I can share on top of what is already there so uh, so the, so digital technology for me uh, it's an interesting kind of let's say segue for me to discuss this because it's um, yeah and I think that particular investment I did you know from around to 2005 in, in with te digital technology that I had to learn um, really gave me that opportunity. So, you know, I think I put the investment in there and it, allow, it opens up a whole other area of research and understanding craft mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been possible. And now I feel like, oh, there's all this talk about the AI and, and AI, uh, it's really, really topical and I, I feel like yeah, yeah, it actually, it will solve a lot of this problem that I was having with this <laughs> robotic arm because the robot was actually just unable to understand when the clay was going to be too heavy and then just collapse, mm -hmm. you know. I, and and I, I think that, uh, yeah, digital technology can play a really interesting part yeah. also in terms of how we engage with craft mm -hmm. for the future. Yeah. And what does a good life look like in the future? <laughs> and it's a question that's been repeated a number of times, but I mean, what, what would you say, Annie? How okay. would you? So I'm gonna stay with education for a moment because, um, because a, a good life is about educating and expressing head, heart, and hand all together. I love this um, slightly obscure fact that the original three R's were not reading, writing, and arithmetic. They were reading, writing, and 
rotting, right? Rotting, making, like a wheel right, like a, a right. Um, and uh, so our forebears kind of understood that you need to educate the body and the mind and the heart, the emotions. And to me, um, craft values are about being kind, empathic, relational, right? Curious of wondering what is, of being experimental, picking up the clay or getting the robot arm and like, what can we make with this? Uh, curious, kind, curious, but also about taking action, about being bold, okay, with your hands, getting your hands dirty. So to me, a good future um, embodies those three things, kind, curious, and bold. And it recognizes that we are in and of the earth of the ecology we are not separate from it and we are co-creating with it oh, i love that i adore that Go on. well i'm going to stick to, i'm going to just dry home my my, <laughs> my one word maintenance so i you know the the good the good life is when we are more and more able to you know to buy into this idea of maintenance it's not about uh, just a human, it's not just a human world. I think it's, you know, it's minerals and it's bio, it's, it's everything. And we just have to learn how to maintain this, you know, good relationship. I mean, I think something that really kind of embodies the craft aspect is making sure that it's tangible, right? So, you know, I think we surround ourselves with lots of synthetic materials in the built environment. A, because it's sort of high performance, it's cheap, it's, you know, accessible in the market through vast supply chains. But really, does that make us happy in the lived experience in our homes and our cities? Um, again, sort of to build on what the previous panel was saying, it's sort of really making sure that nature is accessible within cities. So in terms of how the landscape's designed, but also what the built landscape is built from as well. So whether that's stones or woods, and so really kind of grounding that in, in natural material to remind us of what's out there when we're inside. Gosh, I love that. I mean, as, and there's a real kind of um, connective set of, a connective way of kind of describing that future that I feel speaks to so many of the themes that have been that have been kind of navigated today. And I think that they are the sort of big questions of this time of how we actually create the sorts of answers to the big questions of sustainability and equity, but you know, how we also kind of just, we make a world that feels, that feels fairer, that feels better for particularly young people. And um, the examples that you gave are kind of exquisite examples that I would kind of absolutely love to see more of in a more in a greater variety of places and uh, like so much of the sessions today that um, there is so much food for thought but also so much to feel incredibly optimistic about mm -hmm. even in the context of wider deeper very kind of um, complex challenges. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much to our speakers today, Annie, Guan, Peter, absolutely kind of magnificent and very inspiring. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you, guys. <laughs>